Hey guys, it's Friday, 1.16 p.m. on March 6th, 2020. And I was standing in the kitchen today listening to Luke 10 and how Jesus was talking about sending out the 70 and the instructions that he gave them. And I started thinking about this time that I was shunned by the Jehovah's Witnesses. And it made me realize that I need to start sharing some of my um, testimony with you guys it's because things are starting to accelerate and in order for me to do the full testimony of what is happening in my life to share with you guys just some of these amazing details I'm gonna have to start bringing you guys up to speed so first let me just give you the example that came to mind with Luke 10 there was a period of time when the Jehovah's Witnesses used to knock at my door and then I started noticing that they didn't and one day I was looking out the window and I could see him walking through the neighborhood. So I got ready for them to come to my house and they walked right by. So I went out into the sidewalk and I started calling to them and they completely ignored me. Like I wasn't even there. Now I've never, ever been rude to the Jehovah's Witnesses. I am so excited to see them or the Mormons or the Seventh-day Adventists. When they show up at my door, I'm like, come on in, let's talk. I mean, I love to talk about Jesus and share my testimony and apparently they must have some sort of a code by address because they knew not to talk to me and I, I was actually kind of mad about that and I realized I was being shunned by them so I went into the garage and I got an old for sale sign um, that I had and I put on it uh, a piece of paper and I wrote in really big letters this verse here do not go from house to house now the reason that made me laugh and think about this today is that the, this is why it pertains to my channel when Jesus is telling these guys to not go house to house, it's not just because it's a detection that the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons or whatever. Door-to-door -door evangelism isn't what we're supposed to do. What does Jesus tell us to do? He tells us to live among these people. He, t he gives that instruction in Jeremiah 29. He gives the instruction here in Luke 10. And the purpose of this is literally the laborer is worthy of his wages. Now, he's not just talking about going in and getting a job in the, in the city because who provides the wages God provides for us. And it's in that provision that God gives to us when we don't have an extra pair of sandals and when we don't have, you know, money, or we, but we still have everything we need when we need it. That's the testimony that we bring about the kingdom of God because you can't serve two ma masters. You can't serve mammon and God. If you're totally serving God, you guys, the stuff that God does for you is really amazing. And that's why I know I need to start sharing my testimony with you guys because God is amazing in my life in every single day all the time. And now that it looks like, you know, we've got some pretty ugly things on the horizon here with the stock market and with the scare of the coronavirus. And I got to give you guys some details about this here as how it pertains in my life. You guys, I, I need to be able to share with you guys how not only do I know the Bible, but I've lived it. Like God gives me everything I need when I need it. And I'm going to try and give you just one small example here. In 2018, my mom and I were leaving that Amish farm that we went to to go pick out her shed. And I'll tell you about that. Anyway, we're, but we're driving on this road here in, Man, in uh, Michigan, in a town called Manton, Michigan. And as you can see, Manton is in the absolute middle of nowhere. So as we're driving up this road here, and all of a sudden I just said to my mom, Mom, do you have to go to the bathroom? She said no. And I said, well, okay, let's just stop anyway. And for some reason, I don't even know why. I just pulled right into this parking lot here. It was too early for lunch. Neither of us were hungry. But since we were there, I decided, well, let's just order a burger. So we sat down. We both went to the bathroom. And it was kind of like, well, we weren't in a hurry to go anywhere, so it didn't matter. And as we sat there, a young man walked into this restaurant. Now the man, I would say he was probably early 20s, was scruffy. He was obviously homeless. The guy did not have any money. He had ripped up tattered clothing. We were literally in the middle of nowhere. It's not somewhere you would expect to see a, a, a homeless person. And we could kind of tell because we were sitting at this table. It's such a small restaurant. We could kind of tell that he was trying to negotiate to get a free meal. So my mom and I just piped in and we asked the waitress, you know, does he need help? And uh, she, my mom said, because if he needs something, we'll pay for his meal, which was really cool. So um, he waited for his meal. And then as he got, got it in a paper bag, I invited him over to sit down and eat with us. And we sat and talked to him for a little while. And I'll just try and give you the long and the short of it. Was this, this was a kid who was raised in a Christian household. 
And something had happened in his life because although he knew the scriptures and he referred to them, he was referring to them in a very jumbled, very bad way. And it was really, it was heartbreaking for me to hear this kid misusing the scriptures as he did. And I could tell that he was suffering from probably a demon possession of some sort, although he, he seemed to be pretty harmless. And, and as I sat there, just shocked that God put this kid into my life and I invited him to sit at our table, it suddenly dawned on me that his teeth were perfect. And I thought, oh my gosh, his parents have invested in his mouth. He's got parents that are probably wondering where he is. And so this whole like sudden like f- deposit came over me. I understood that I needed to get as much information about this kid as I possibly could because I was going to have to tell his parents that I had met him and that I had counseled him in the truth of the scriptures, and I knew that's what I was there for. So I got as much information, asking him questions about himself, which he did not pick up on, that I was trying to determine who this kid was, um, and that I was trying to get information about his family. But I I sat there like a little detective, asking him all the right questions and and memorizing all these things to details in my head. And um, at the very end of the conversation, it was time to go, uh, I asked him, I said, would you mind if I call your mom and dad and tell them that you're okay? And he was like, no way. And I'm like, oh, come on. I knew enough about what he'd already said so far that I could pretty much find him, and I did. But he did not want me to talk to his parents. And so when we got in the car, I just grabbed a piece of paper, and I started writing all this stuff down, and I started, and my mom's like, what are you doing? I'm like, mom, tell me everything you remember about his name. we got to go contact his parents. I'm just, like, convinced we have to do this. So on the way home, we looked all through my mom's cell phone trying to figure out how to reach these people. And by the time we got back to the cottage, sure enough, we'd gotten a phone number for what we thought was his mom. And I called and I talked to her. And the long and the short of it was both his mom and his dad were at home when I called. And the night before, they at church had been praying in their church, a small group church, that God would send somebody into this young man's life and strain him out on some things in their errors in scripture and update the parents. And that's exactly what I did. I literally sat there on the phone for an hour and a half with this mother and father who were in tears and just shocked. And I updated them on everything that I had just experienced with their son. Now, that is a typical, typical example of how God works in my life. And I'm very familiar with this. This kind of stuff happens to me every single day because I walk 100% in faith. I can give you guys amazing stories of like just almost Elijah and the oil or Elisha and the oil. I mean, it's, 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 it's like that with me. Now, let me explain to you why I think I have to start doing these videos now, because not all, all, not all the details of how they all piece together in my life are simple. Like, let's see, how long is this video so far? This video is eight minutes. They're not all eight minute stories. Okay. Some of them take a little bit longer to explain. And so what I need to do now is bring you guys up to speed on a couple of details that have surrounded the way I perceive what's going on with this coronavirus and surround the way that I I perceive what's happening with the stock market. So let's back up here and just let me take you to a couple of details here about my channel. Um, What I just want to point out really quick is that you guys mostly know that I've done videos on exposing the false doctrine that is concealed covertly in the church that I was brought to in 2018, right? Well, what you may not know is the way that I found out about that church was that a text message from a guy who works security at that church hit my son's cell phone. And my son and I had been praying earlier that day that we would find a church that we could attend. And sure enough, we get this text message completely from people we don't even know about church security that night in a county that wasn't even near me. And... So I, I did research into the church, and as you guys know what happens from there, I, I ended up joining that church. And, and it, I thought it was for my own comfort and um, sustenance, but obviously it was for me to testify to them that their doctrines were false doctrines and do what I did. It was in service to the Lord, so that's okay. But the bottom line is that it was through a text message that came to my son. Okay, now, let me just tell you about this. So... I joined that church in March of 2018, and you guys may recall from the fact that I uploaded these videos on my experience in foster children, with the experience of foster children, that by March of 2018, the middle of March 2018, I was down in Arizona taking care of foster kids. Now, what you don't know is that the very day that I took um, membership at that church, it was our membership brunch, 
I was sitting down with the pastor at this membership brunch, the pastor and his wife, and they were asking me about some of the amazing details of the things that I have to say about my testimony, right? And I I chokingly, I said, well, you never know what's going to happen with me. I could be on a plane by the end of the week. And sure enough, that afternoon, I got home from the membership brunch, and my sister-in-law and my brother called, and they're like, we just got these kids dropped off, these foster kids, and they were very, very troubled foster children. They didn't even have shoes. They got dropped off in the middle of the night. Anyway, needless to say, I was on an airplane by the end of the week. And these videos here, the series of videos that I uploaded between March and June of 2018, were based on my experiences caring for the foster children. Well, now, here's the behind the scenes stuff that you don't know. I got back in June, the first week of June, and I was actually kind of lonely. Everything was very this was a, this was spiritually and emotionally very um, intense this experience with these foster kids and and I wish I had made more videos explaining to you about my personal experience at that time because it's clear to me now that that's more along the lines of the things I need to do with you guys is share with you guys the personal um, triumphs and difficulties that I'm experiencing so that you guys can go through this with me because the testimony is amazing but anyway I got back in June and I was lonely really lonely the first week i was so you guys i just i wept i wept for the kids i wept for my my siblings i wept for i wept for me i wept for everybody it was so tiring and so sad and so hard and by the way it's worked out beautifully now but it took several years for this to pan out but anyway so i prayed that night i remember sitting there in my bed and just i didn't have any pets my house was so quiet my heart was so empty because both my children were were old enough to not be living with me anymore and I didn't, my dogs had died like six to eight months before then. And it was just this, it was a deafening silence in my house. And I prayed to God. I was like, God, I know you have me travel in places. I never know where I'm going to be from one minute to the next. But Lord, if it's your will, please let me have a pet. I was like, I really, I would really like to have a pet. And I sat there struggling with this prayer request in my head because I thought, you know, maybe God doesn't want me to have a pet because I travel and blah, blah. And I said, but either way, I'll listen for the meow of a kitty. Okay. The next day, that son who got the misdirected text message about Cornerstone Church, well, the next day, my son called me and he said, Mom, we were driving through Oak Park and we found a dog and we don't have time to take care of it. Maybe this is a pet. Maybe God wants you to have a pet. So they came over and they dropped this off at my house. Well, I wasn't sure what to do with this dog. I mean, this was a dog. I was asking for a kitty. And I figured that this dog probably had a mom and dad out there. This was no kitty. And this dog probably had a mom and dad out there that were very worried about him because he was obviously not the kind of dog that could survive in an alley very long. And he was so small. And the very first day I had him, that night, he bit me with all four of his teeth so he was very small and he was very old and he bit me and I almost named him jerk because I did not like him anyway the next day I took him to a vet to see if he had a chip in him he did not then I started calling all the police precincts there are many of them around the little area where I was living and nobody had been missing a dog and then I looked up how to post this stuff online for this dog and I was thinking, of course nobody wants him. He's a jerk. This dog bit me, and he was not very nice. But he ended up growing on me. And as you can imagine, I ended up falling in love with this dog. And I named him Shrimp because he's so small. And Shrimp and I became best buddies. Now, the really amazing thing about Shrimp is that because Shrimp was so old, Shrimp didn't require a lot. He let me know when he had to go outside and all he did all day was sit around next to me when I was doing my Bible study. And obviously, I fell in love with him. Who would not fall in love with this adorable little dog? You guys, I love this little dog. I want you to hear him snoring. Listen to this. <laughs> Isn't he cute? You guys, and he would sit there and he would dream and he would be running in place and he was dreaming. I just, I love him. And I just want to share another thing with you guys. Look at this. I would sit here and because, you guys, because I love Shrimp so much, like I was so grateful that God gave me this sweet little dog. 
I would literally fall on my knees and thank God for him like four or five times a day. I just love this dog so much, right? So I want to hear. I want you to hear like the kinds of songs that I would sing to God about shrimp. Listen to this one. This is just a dumb one I recorded. Hopefully, I'll be able to play it for you. I thank my God for shrimp because he's awfully little cute. He's fun and he's a lot of fun to cuddle with. I thank my God because he brought me shrimp just in the nick of time. And I love shrimp. I love shrimp all the time. Well, the song goes on, but basically you guys get the gist. As I would pray realizing that this was a total gift from God and knowing that shrimp is an old dog. I was also praying heartily for God to prepare me for whatever was coming because I know that shrimp wasn't going to live forever and that when it was time for shrimp to go, that that would be a time for me to be moving on. And I knew that shrimp was going to be with me until I couldn't have a pet anymore. I just, I knew this. This is stuff I've known for two years. Now, let's just talk about what we know about the coronavirus because again that one son who gave me the text link to uh cornerstone baptist church the one son who gave me the uh the dog dropped him off at my house is also the one son who told me about the coronavirus because he's at that age where he and his peers use a tool called 4chan which i hate because that's where all the q information came from so anyway he's been talking about this coronavirus and i've just been like disgusted with it. I didn't want to hear it. So when he called me and told me about it in January, I was like, oh, stop talking about it. I don't want to hear it anymore. And then he called me at the beginning of February and he said, mom, did you know that Jeff Bezos sold the majority share of his Amazon stock and that he was just seen in New Zealand? And for all the dismissive stuff I had said before, I suddenly said, what? Because that bothered me. If you guys have studied anything about what happened in September 11th or you know anything, even going back to the Rothschilds and Napoleon, if you know about how the big power money elite operate, when they start dumping their stocks, if there's not a very good reason for it, like they've resigned or they've got cancer and they're going to die or something, you know, if they start, when they start dumping their stock, there's a problem. So as soon as I heard this, I started looking into it and I'm like, whoa. Not only did he get rid of a bunch of stock in February, but he started this in August and his ex-wife followed suit and he unloaded everything in the beginning of February and he moved to, to um, New Zealand. Wow. Then I started learning that it wasn't just Jeff Bezos, but it was Peter Thiel. He also up offloaded 81% of his Facebook stock, you guys, and he did this the same week that... Bezos sold his within the same week. And the president of Disney suddenly stepped down and I was like, wait a minute, what the heck is going on with this, right? Now, I was still skeptical about the virus and I didn't understand or even really think about how finances and the virus would be related, okay? But within a couple of days of this coming together, I, was, I wasn't totally convinced that there was gonna be a problem but I was kind of a little bit, taking it a little bit more seriously. And then my son had a spiritual attack one night. And he called me about 2 o'clock in the morning having had a spiritual attack. And I could tell he was having a spiritual attack because there was no reason for him to be as worried as he was about the coronavirus. And I got mad at him. And I told him, I mean, I chastised him like I'm not mad at him. I mean, I chastised him very firmly. And I said, look. We have been through enough over the last 16 years that you know better than to worry like this. I'm like, this is, this is sin. You cannot worry about this. And I said, and biblically speaking, we know better than this. And practically speaking, we come from a medical family. So if there is concern about this virus, the people who are physicians in our lives are going to start getting worried about this. And number two, if this is a global pandemic, we have friends and family all over the world. They are going to start getting sick and we're going to start hearing about it. I said, as long as we're just relying on videos of strangers on 4chan and videos of some strange things and some accounts of people we've never even heard of falling sick, because this was still the beginning of February, I was like, I'm not going to worry about this. And so anyway, we prayed and he, he felt better and everything was cool. Well, in that, I want to emphasize, I uttered two 
benchmarks. One, that the, that the doctors in our family would start getting worried. And number two, that because we had friends and family all over the world, <sighs> that we would, we would hear about this from them. Well, you guys, I don't know how many of you have ever heard of this tiny little country. It's the smallest republic in the world inside of Italy. But that is where my family's from. And uh, unfortunately, you guys, we heard the other day that there happened to be a handful of people in the Republic of San Marino that have the coronavirus. And I got a message the other morning that three of them are my immediate aunt and uncle and cousin. So that kind of freaked me out. So here I had just given my son this benchmark that the medical people in our family will start getting concerned, which they are, and that we would probably start hearing from family members that were getting it or hear about this from our European family. And sure enough, three of the people in San Marino, out of the 21 in San Marino that have this, happen to be my aunt and uncle and my cousin, who I know very well personally, and they are sick with this. And then, you guys, on top of that, shrimp got respiratory distress on February 28th and had to be put down the morning of February 29th. So what you don't know is that I have had a plane ticket to go down to Arizona to help my family with some stuff on next Wednesday, March 11th. And I was a little worried about bringing shrimp down there. He's traveled with me down to Arizona before. He's good on an airplane. He likes his little his little bag. But I just I just kind of had this weird feeling. And um, God took him home on the 29th of February. And uh, now the adventure begins. Now the adventure begins. I don't know exactly what's on the horizon, but I definitely know that the coronavirus is real because I have an aunt and an uncle that are suffering from it in Italy, and they're very old. In fact, they're my aunt and uncle in terms of they're my grandmother's brother and sister-in-law. And uh, my grandma died a couple of years ago. So they're, they're older, but my cousin's my age. So we don't know what's going to happen with those guys. We pray for, for their recovery. And um, now that all these, these details have convened, and I know that the Lord is going to put me in another position to do other things for him now, and it requires that I don't have my little companion. And, and you guys, it took me three days of crying to get over the cutest little dog in the world. And I, I just totally thank God that he let me have this sweet little dog because we are best buddies. But uh, things are going to change. And one of the reasons I think God wants me to do this video for you guys is so that you can see by my, my own example about how confident I am that everything's going to be okay. And maybe I'm supposed to chart this with you. I don't know. But let me just give you the latest and greatest. Uh, my folks are deciding whether or not they want me to bring down their little SUV that's up at the place I'm staying right now. If they want me to drive that down to Arizona or they want me to fly. I have a ticket to fly down. I have a one-way ticket. That's how I always fly to Arizona and how I always fly home because I don't know how long I'm going to stay. And, um, you know, I really don't like going down there without a return ticket but because I, 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 I end up wanting to go home way before I get the, the ticket home. But... Anyway, we'll just see. I, I don't know. I might end up driving to Arizona. I'll let you guys know. I'll keep you posted on this. And anyway, I just wanted to update you guys and let you know that there are some very serious signs, at least in my life, that things are going to start changing. And for what it's worth, I want to share my faith with you guys a little bit more to share with you the cool ways that God works in my life. So hopefully this will be interesting to you guys and you'll be along for the ride of the adventure. And I'll keep you posted. All right, you guys. Have a good day. So sometimes his circumstances are painful, but you have to ask yourself the question, what's more important, my ease, comfort, and pleasure, or hearing from God? If you're willing to listen, he will use circumstances that are difficult sometimes uh, in order to get the message to us. And then sometimes God speaks through other people. He may choose someone that you don't even like or someone that you have a difficult time having a relationship with. But sometimes God speaks through others. So the important thing is this, and that is that he's speaking because he wants to give us clear direction for how he wants us to live. 
And it's unwise for me to think that he's got a plan and that I'm not going to listen. Listening is, listen, listening is the key. And so I would simply say to you, before, when you decide to pray, when you kneel down or sit in the chair, whatever it might be, just think about this. Before you start talking and telling God about all these things that he already knows about or complaining about or whatever it might be, why don't you take time just to be quiet and just sit quietly and just say this to him. Heavenly Father, I need to listen to you. I'm going to be quiet, and I just want you to speak to my heart and help me to listen carefully so that I can do exactly what you want me to do. How do you think God will respond to that? I'll tell you how. He will say to you exactly what you need to hear. And when he does, don't say, oh, well, I, I, that was just my imagination. No. God promises to lead you. Listen to what he says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. He will direct your path. But I must acknowledge him. Respect him. Love him. Adore him. And obey him. Whatever he says. And so.